Hardly anyone will deny that the universe, a repository for boundless lines of inquiry, occupies a unique place in our collective core of curiosity. This fact also renders the universe a repository for our boundless collective ignorance. Small wonder that the heavens have served as the literal and spiritual home of most gods people have worshipped over the millennia. A common task of deities is to control all that seems mysterious to our mortal minds and out of control to our mortal bodies. In the gulf between the depths of human curiosity and the limits of human ignorance resides a series of questions, some of which we all have asked and all of which some of us have asked. Not all have answers. For those that do, our answers may be incomplete or inadequate. For the remaining queries, we can look around on earth and up into the heavens to declare with confidence and a bit of pride that at least some of the universe is knowable to the human mind. But we must also humbly recognize that as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. Cosmic queries will feed your curiosity with the deepest questions anybody has ever asked about our place in the universe. But these pages will also dip you into the eddies of our uncertainties and dangle you by your ankles above the gaps of our knowledge. Why? Because therein lies the true source of curiosity and wonder, the not knowing. Coupled with its only antidote, the need to know, empowered by the methods and tools of science applied to the cosmic frontier. Chapter 1 What is our place in the universe? Is Earth a planet? Astronomy with a stick? The parallax solution? How big is the solar system? Henrietta Leavitt and the standard candle? galaxies. Billions and billions. A final word. One. Isaac Newton and Aristotle walk into a bar. They're engaged in an ongoing debate over what is actually going on when an object falls to earth. Both imagine the scene, but they see completely different things. In Aristotle's world, everything is made from the four basic elements of earth, air, fire, and water. The object, made of Earth and not any of the other three elements, has an innate desire to seek the center of the universe, which, in Aristotle's view, is the same as the center of Earth. This was, after all, self-evident to him that all heavenly bodies orbited Earth, which was itself stationary. The object, then, was compelled by its inner nature to fall. Newton doesn't care what the object is made of, only that it has mass— he knows that Earth exerts a gravitational force on every object at its surface. His law of universal gravitation tells him that anything dropped to Earth's surface will fall because of this force. He also knows that the same force, extending out into space, keeps the moon in its orbit, and that without the constant tug of gravity, the moon would fly off into space. Aristotle orders a retsina. Newton orders a stiff mead. Over their drinks, they debate which view is right. Newton proposes a simple test. In his theory, neglecting air resistance, all objects dropped to Earth's surface will fall at the same rate. For Aristotle, a bigger object has more Earth element than a smaller one, and therefore will fall faster, in proportion to how much Earth element it contains. They ask the bartender for a penny, and an expensive bottle of bourbon and discover that both, although of very different mass, do indeed fall at the same rate. Newton points out that testing our ideas against nature is the core of the scientific method, a technique that has led to profound changes in the human condition through the search for objective truths and an understanding of our place in the universe. Aristotle pays for the drinks and the broken bottle of bourbon.